men's sexual health and infertility treatment. Uh, Dr. Stahl, thanks for taking the time to be here with us and looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you for the introduction, Mike, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I love this endeavor and I'm happy to participate. So what I'm going to try to do today <clears throat> is uh, really go through a lot of the basics of male fertility. Um, and um, I'm going to try and review the rationale for evaluating the male partner of a subfertile couple, review how we think about evaluating uh, subfertile men and management strategies for some commonly encountered clinical scenarios. So I'm going to make this a case-based approach. Uh, so uh, hopefully um, for the residents out there, you guys can think through these cases, think about what you might do, um, and then I will, uh, you'll see what I did. Um, so this first case um, is a 37-year-old um, healthy male. Uh, he is uh, trying to conceive with a healthy 35-year-old who has never been pregnant. They've been trying for three years. Uh, as is commonly the case, she presented to a reproductive endocrinologist, had an evaluation, um, and uh, that evaluation was very reassuring in that she has normal menstrual cycles, uh, normal ovarian reserve testing uh, by uh, a day three FSH level and a negative uh, hysterosalpingogram. So just to pause for a second, so why, you know, why evaluate the male? So in urology, this doesn't come up that often because that's you know what we do. But in uh, the infertility world, there is a, um, a, a suboptimal referral rate of male partners in subfertile couples. Um, the incredibly uh, the incredible success of assisted reproductive technologies like uh, in vitro fertilization have been great in terms of pregnancy rates for couples with even severe infertility. Um, but that combined with some financial incentives um, driven by uh, the, the revenues that are generated by IVF has resulted in uh, a lower rate of referrals for urological evaluation. So, so why do we want to evaluate that? Well, one, because men cause or contribute to 40 or 50% of couple related subfertility. Um, two, because there are often treatable male factors that can enable natural reproduction. And that's important um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, assisted reproductive technologies are absolutely safe. Uh, they're effective. But uh, if you really look at the data, uh, there are links between use of assisted reproductive technologies, such as in vitro fertilization, and a slightly increased risk of congenital anomalies in offspring. Whether or not that's related to uh, the assistive reproductive process itself and kind of the bypass of the natural selection process that occurs during fertilization within the female reproductive tract, or whether or not that's uh, indicative of simply infertile couples having a higher risk of having children that have congenital anomalies is not clear. But uh, in repeated studies, there is a very statistically significant, um, although the absolute difference is not that high, there's a statistically significant increase in congenital anomalies associated with use of assisted reproductive technology. Um, in some men, you can identify uh, uh, genetic lesions that can contribute to infertility or disease in offspring. Um, so 7% of severely oligozoospermic men uh, will have a detectable transmissible genetic lesion that uh, either can impact uh, the fertility of any sons conceived or potentially can uh, increase the risk of disease in offspring. Uh, and in azospermic men, that's as high as 10% uh, for a transmissible genetic lesion that contributes to infertility and a 17% risk of having a identifiable genetic issue that might uh, affect the health of offspring. Um, the other thing, and this is data from our own practice that we actually haven't yet published, um, but we presented at AUA a couple of years ago, um, male infertility is often the presenting sign of occult health relevant conditions. So in my practice, uh, about a quarter of men that are evaluated for infertility, we end up diagnosing uh, something medically important and health relevant, uh, the most common of which is testosterone deficiency. So let's get back to this case. Um, 
you take a focused history and it's unremarkable. He has normal sexual function, he has no urological history, no testicular pain or discomfort. Um, on physical examination, uh, he's a normal appearing uh, guy, but uh, on his general exam, uh, he's got an 18 cc normal consistency right testis with a 14 cc soft left testis. And this is what his physical examination looks like. Um, so that's a grade three left varicocele. Um, I don't know if you guys can can see my pointer. Alex, can you see this? Or Mike, can you see my arrow? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. So what you see here is uh, a visibly obvious fullness in the left hemiscrotum above the left testis, which is down here. Um, that makes it grade three. I, you know, very often uh, we talk about varicocele grading, and I think because infertility is not at the forefront of inpatient urology. Um, it's not uncommon to, to forget the varicocele grading system, but it's very simple and straightforward. Um, grade one varicoceles, uh, you cannot see, you can only feel with a Valsalva maneuver. Grade two varicoceles, you cannot see, but you can feel obviously before making somebody or asking somebody to Valsalva. And grade three varicoceles are visibly obvious. Um, a varicocele that is uh, not detectable on physical examination, but is detectable on a scrotal ultrasound, is considered a subclinical varicocele. There's some controversy about whether or not you ought to address that. Um, my general take on that is that most subclinical varicoceles are in fact subclinical and not major contributors to infertility. Um, varicocele, of course, refers to abnormal dilation of the pampiniform plexus. It's clearly associated with poor semen quality. The mechanism by which varicoceles exert their negative impact on spermatogenesis is not uh, fully clear. Uh, it is probably due to temperature dysregulation or increased venous pressures, um, but there are some other uh, things looking at uh, mRNA and protein expression in semen that show some differences when compared to men without varicoceles. Regardless of the etiology, varicoceles are uh, the most common identifiable correctable etiology of male infertility. Um, rates are as high as 15% in the adult male population. 35% in men with primary infertility, meaning they've never contributed to a pregnancy, uh, and as high as 80% of men who have secondary infertility. And that's somebody who got somebody pregnant earlier in their life, but is now currently having a problem. And that's because varicoceles exert a duration dependent, very slow negative impact on sperm production and quality that accrues over time. Um, let's just talk about uh, Laboratory evaluation. Um, obviously, we're going to get a semen analysis in this patient, um, but it's important to understand when you get a semen analysis how to interpret that and what each of the parameters is assessing. Uh, the most important thing that I think a lot of people don't know is that normal values are simply based on a distribution, uh, like a bell curve that was derived from a population of fertile men who successfully conceived. So in 2010, the World Health Organization put out its most recent uh, guidance with regards to uh, semen testing and defined normal values. So in the WHO, the way the WHO came up with their normal values was, again, they made a bell curve of men with proven fertility and they de defined the fifth centile as the lower limit of normal. Um, so semen analysis is not a test of sperm function, but it does give you an idea. Um, and these are the, uh, if you look in the right column of that table, uh, the World Health Organization 2010 parameters are that you should have at least 1.5 uh, cc's in terms of overall semen volume, a sperm concentration of at least 15 million per milliliter, a total sperm concentration of uh, at least 39 million, which is simply derived by multiplying semen volume times sperm concentration, uh, at least 40% overall motility, um, it's not listed here, but 32% progressive motility and 4% strictly normal morphology. So let's just talk about each of those. So as I mentioned, uh, semen analysis is not a direct measure of fertility. There are no appropriate cutoff numbers below which unassisted conception, that is getting pregnant by having sex, is impossible. And there is a significant overlap between fertile and subfertile populations. So if you look at these graphs, this is an older New England Journal study, but I, I think this data is really helpful to think about. And if you look at um, sperm concentration on the left, uh, motility in the middle, and morphology on the right, you see that 
the, the significant differences uh, between the rates of unassisted conception in fertile and unfertile men. So the fertile bars are the uh, dark colored bars, the, the white bars are in infertile men. And what we're looking at is the percentage of men who successfully conceived through uh, sexual intercourse. And you see, uh, you know, really it's a sperm concentration of less than 13.5 million per ml, where you start seeing sperm concentration matter, um, less than 32% motility and uh, morphology I'll get a little bit into later. But um, just because somebody has an abnormal semen analysis does not mean they're not gonna conceive naturally. Uh, so it's always important to take into consideration the duration of infertility when you're making treatment decisions, particularly if they involve surgery. These are the background rates of natural fertility uh, in men who present for uh, infertility evaluations. Um, and um, you see that uh, in normal men, uh, in men with normal semen parameters, which is the green line, um, about 90% of men who come in with a chief complaint of infertility uh, in whom their semen testing is normal, about 90% of them will successfully conceive within a year and almost 100 uh, within two. That is of course assuming that there are no female factors at play. Um, but even in men with pretty low, um, with low or very low sperm concentrations, uh, there's a significant rate of background infertility. So, you know, at one year, 40% um, of oligozoospermic men and uh, about 20% of severely oligozoospermic men will conceive naturally. And that's just important to keep in mind. Um, there's also tremendous variability in human sperm density. This is directly from the World Health Organization 2010 publication. Um, looking at a single person's sperm count. Uh, they asked somebody to give a semen sample uh, every week, basically, or every couple of weeks for uh, a couple of years. And you see this tremendous, tremendous variation. Uh, this is why we repeat semen analyses. And it's, it's really important not to make too much of any, you know, one particular analysis. Um, Concentration reflects sperm production relative to seminal vesicle and prostatic fluid production. It's not uncommon. I get referred somebody uh, to be evaluated for a low sperm count because they have a sperm concentration of say 10 million per milliliter. But then you look at their semen analysis and their semen volume is seven milliliters, which is very, very high. That person you know, doesn't have a problem producing sperm. They're just very good at making semen and they have very productive seminal vesicles and prostatic fluid production. Um, some terms you'll see are oligozoospermia, which is the proper term for less than 15 million sperm per ml, cryptozoospermia, or hidden sperm, so that refers to very rare sperm seen, you know, usually in the uh, pellet-derived after centrifugation of a semen sample, and azospermia, which refers to no sperm being found in the pellet. It's important to know that azospermia doesn't mean that there are no sperm in the ejaculate, actually. The threshold is probably somewhere between 30 and 60,000 sperm per milliliter. That's the sensitivity of a standard semen analysis. Um, and um, the, like I said, the best way to really think about sperm production is to multiply the semen volume times sperm concentration and look at that relative to the lower limit of normal established by the WHO, which is about 40 million sperm per milliliter. Uh, motility refers to the percentage of sperm that twitch or move. Uh, progressive motility uh, refers to the percentage of sperm that move forward. You're, you'll see two ways that progressive motility are often reported on uh, semen analyses, particularly the labs that are in New York. Many labs still use the older World Health Organization methodology where they actually grade sperm from one to four. You know, four being as uh, Mark Goldstein, who mentored me, used to say the Olympic swimmers. One is just twitching and two and three are in the middle. Uh, subsequently, the WHO has uh, sort of come down on the side of that's too subjective and arbitrary. So now they just report progressive motility. That's the percentage of sperm that are actually visually moving across a high-powered field. Um, that's supposed to be 32% now. Astenozoospermia just is the technical term referring to low motility. So that's either less than 40% of your sperm moving at all or less than 32% of sperm uh, moving progressively. And low motility can reflect poor production, uh, an insult after the testis, such as varicocele infection, uh, anti-sperm antibodies uh, occasionally present with low motility and uh, gonadotoxins can also affect sperm motility. Uh, morphology um, is a very, very commonly abnormal parameter that uh, kind of drives me crazy. Um, it refers to, uh, there have been various iterations for how to score sperm morphology. 
Originally, the World Health, Organ World Health Organization methodology was fairly loose with, uh, um, it was not that hard to be called a normal sperm and the normal value was at least 30% normal. Um, uh, that was modified um, by somebody named Dr. Kruger who espoused a more stringent scoring system where originally uh, the criteria were such that normal values were 14% or more and now it's gotten even stricter and the normal percentage of sperm with uh, normal morphology is now 4% or better. Whether or not that matters is very, very unclear and controversial. The early studies about morphology um, really pretty clearly linked morphology to natural and assisted reproductive outcomes, but better studies performed more re recently have really called that into question. Um, uh, this is a study from Larry Lipschultz um, looking at men who have a 0% normal sperm. So that's obviously something that uh, creates a lot of anxiety for a couple. They get a semen analysis back and the percentage of sperm that are normal shape is reported as zero. Um, and so Dr. Lipschultz and his group reported on how do those guys do in terms of getting their partners pregnant and actually they do pretty well. Uh, the rate of unassisted pregnancy is still around 30% versus um, about 60% in men that have very normal morphology values. Um, but even in the most extreme case with 0% normal forms, uh, men appear to do pretty well with unassisted and with assisted conception. Um, the studies that are looking at men with 1, 2, and 3% strict normal morphology for IUI and natural conception outcomes are even closer. Uh, this is a parameter that I think is actually going to go away. Um, because I don't think it's that clinically useful. Round cells refer to inflammation in the semen. Um, uh, you have to remember that you need to stain specifically immature sperm or immature germ cells, look a lot like white blood cells. And if a laboratory doesn't stain with peroxidase or another uh, methodology to distinguish immature germ cells from white blood cells, then you can't know what you're looking at. But uh, if you have a high number of white blood cells in semen that's obviously suggestive of an inflammatory or infectious process and there are various tests that you might pursue like a semen culture testing for anti-sperm antibodies uh, however very often it's tough to elucidate the cause of round cells and it's tough to get rid of them endocrine testing is important if you look at the aua guidelines for the evaluation of the subfertile male uh, there's a best practice statement out there and really what you need for sure is an early AM total testosterone level because of the association of male infertility with um, testosterone deficiency uh, and an FSH level. FSH is the gonadotropin produced by the anterior pituitary that drives sperm production. It's regulated by a hormone called inhibin, which you can also measure and is sometimes used clinically, but inhibin is produced by Sertoli cells. Um, so the higher your uh, inhibin level is, that is reflective of good sperm production that inhibits FSH production. And so you get normal FSH levels. When you see an FSH level that's above about six, you start worrying about uh, testicular dysfunction and a problem with sperm production. It's also important to remember that most of the laboratories that report serum FSH levels use a normal value derived from women. So you'll see an FSH of like 7.9 and that'll be listed as normal. You have to really think about Anything above six, I would say, is abnormal for FSH. So let's get back to this case. Um, so we do the recommended testing. His total testosterone level is 5.6, uh, 562 nanograms per deciliter. That's very normal. His FSH is slightly elevated at 8.5 international units per liter. Um, uh, we get a semen analysis. His volume is 2.9 milliliters. Sperm concentration, 9 million per ml. So you multiply those out, you get a total sperm concentration of around 27 million, 18%. Uh, overall motility, poor progressive motility, and 0% normal forms. So this is very, very typical of what you might see with a varicocele. Um, so just to summarize this particular case, he's 37. He's been trying for three years with his healthy 35-year-old wife who has a reassuring evaluation. He has oligoastenoteratozoospermia uh, and a grade three left varicocele, and he's euganatal. So what do we do? So this is probably the most common clinical scenario that I see in my practice. Um, and uh, there are really are 
two options here. I think it's um, aggressive to say that everybody in this situation should have their varicocele treated. Um, it's a tough decision, uh, especially in New York when people wait, when you have partners who are in their mid to late 30s in couples that want to have uh, many kids. But varicocele treatment um, has the advantages of potentially enabling natural conception, uh, upgrading people from IUI to IVF, uh, upgrading people to IUI from IVF, meaning uh, if a couple presents, um, to do IUI, you need about 5 million moving sperm. Many couples come in with varicoceles and say a total motile sperm count of two or three million. Sometimes repair of their varicocele can get them in from the range in which IVF is required to the range in which they have a reasonable chance of success with intrauterine insemination. That saves patients a lot of money and it's a much less invasive and less stressful process. Um, there is some data, particularly from Cornell uh, and Dr. Goldstein, that varicocele surgery may also uh, protect the uh, Leydig cell function and uh, increase testosterone production. Uh, that's still emerging. I think fixing varicocele specifically and only to address testosterone deficiency, at least in my opinion, is a little bit um, aggressive and unknown at this point. But uh, taking that into consideration as a factor is, is certainly something that I do for a lot of my patients. Um, there's some morbidity to varicocelectomy, although it's uh, very, very minimal. There's about a 2% risk of hydrocele. Uh, there's a remote risk of uh, devascularizing the testis that in very, very rare cases could result in testicular loss. Um, but overall, it's a very safe and effective operation. Um, the advantages of assisted reproduction are that you can start tomorrow. Um, you know, there's a delay associated with varicocele treatment that bothers a lot of couples. You have to get on the OR schedule um, and uh, the improvements that you see in sperm quality after varicocele surgery uh, take about three to six months and sometimes up to a year. Um, so this is a really a shared decision-making process that you engage in with a couple. These visits tend to be long and ideally involve both partners. Um, there is a uh, level one data supporting varicocele as a, uh, an effective treatment for infertility. Um, this is a uh, randomized trial looking at pregnancy outcomes after varicocele treatment in men who have a palpable varicocele and an abnormal semen analysis. There have been prior studies that did not show a pregnancy benefit but most of those included men with either subclinical varicoceles or men with normal semen analyses. So uh, the odds ratio of pregnancy uh, within a year after recovery from varicocele surgery is 2.4. So varicocele surgery double, you know, a little bit more than doubles the chance of achieving a natural pregnancy. And that's, that's a pretty uh, compelling piece of data. Um, there are several different ways to fix varicoceles. Um, there are non-microsurgical approaches, uh, which was uh, developed and described by Palomo. Um, now, uh, most varicocele repairs, uh, at least in New York, are done uh, using a microsurgical subinguinal approach, which is what I do. Um, there are laparoscopic approaches that are very effective, and Joe Lucal, my partner, uh, likes laparoscopic varicocele repairs. And, uh, there's uh, radiologic embolization, which, if they can get into the right place, is has comparable efficacy. Um, the problem with the varicose embolization data is that there's about a 20 to 30 percent rate of uh, interventional radiologists being unable to access the internal somatic veins. And when they do that, they don't count that as a failed procedure. Those patients have generally been excluded from the studies reporting outcomes of embolization for varicoses. Um, so this patient did up for a left microsurgical varicocele repair. It took a little more than an hour. Um, uh, very careful to isolate and uh, spare the lymphatics and the internal stromatic and cremasteric arteries. His semen analysis did improve. Um, they did not get pregnant naturally, but 10 months after surgery, they decided to do intrauterine insemination and his wife got pregnant. All right. I'm gonna shift gears and uh, move on to a second case. 
Um, this is a 28-year-old patient who comes in with his healthy 26-year-old wife. They've been trying for a year and a half. Um, she, again, has a very reassuring evaluation with her OBGYN. I, I don't think she saw a reproductive endocrinologist. Um, he uh, did a semen analysis ordered by his primary care doctor, and he was azospermic. So his semen volume was 2.8 milliliters, uh, pH was 7.8. Uh, it was a properly done analysis. They centrifuged his semen, examined the pellet, and no sperm were identified. All right, so let's talk about azospermia a little bit. Um, first of all, the initial diagnosis of azospermia is made on, you know, based on a semen analysis in which sperm are not detected. As I mentioned previously, however, that does not mean that sperm are not in the ejaculate. Um, and there are variable reports of the lower limit of detection of semen analysis for sperm presence. And it's anywhere from uh, 30,000 to 100,000 sperm, uh, millions, uh, sperm per milliliter. 1% um, of men are azospermic. Um, at least that's the number that we give everybody. Please keep in mind though that that's based on a single uh, cadaveric study that was published a very, very long time ago. Um, uh, there is methodology um, to actually look uh, using fluorescent microscopy in the ejaculate of men who um, are azospermic on a conventional semen analysis. And if you do that and you use um, uh, this method, which is called supersensitive fluorescent uh, microscopy that uses uh, nucleoli, uh, nucle nuclear staining uh, using DAPI, uh, you can find sperm in about a quarter of azospermic men. This has not been widely used, but it's certainly uh, an interesting approach that I I've been wanting to look into a little bit more because I think it would be highly predictive of being able to actually find sperm in men with non-obstructive azospermia, but let's just move on from that. So this guy has no history of cryptorchidism. He developed normally during puberty. He uh, has no history of sexually transmitted infections, scrotal pain, doesn't take any medications, got his college girlfriend pregnant. Uh, she had an elective termination. He's got normal sex drive. He's got great energy. He works out a lot. He's in good shape. Um, on exam, he is fully masculine, you know, fully masculinized, muscular. Uh, he has normal visual fields. He reports a normal sense of smell. Um, sense of smell, he has no gynecomastia, no surgical scars. Penis is normally developed. Uh, he has small soft testicles. Um, his vasa are present and his epididym, uh, th that's not how you spell epididymides, by the way, that's wrong. It's uh, I-D-E-S. Um, but his epididymides feel flat. He has no evidence of varicocele. So just to summarize this case, he's 28. He has a year and a half of secondary infertility with his prior unintended pregnancy. Previously, he has normal volume azospermia. He has no identifiable contributing factors in his history. He's got bilateral testicular atrophy on exam. So uh, the next step here, of course, according to AUA, the AUA best practice statements is to get some blood work. Uh, we'll go over his blood work later. But at this point, when you think about azospermia, there's, you know, one of two problems are present. Either somebody's producing sperm normally and they're blocked up, which is called obstructive azospermia, or they're not producing sperm well or not producing sperm at all. Um, and that is called non-obstructive azospermia. It is difficult um, and actually impossible without a diagnostic biopsy to make a definitive diagnosis of obstructive azospermia but you can get a clue. Um, because the only problem with obstructive azospermia is an obstruction somewhere, that means the testicles are normally functioning. That typically means that a patient will have uh, no symptoms of testosterone deficiency. They'll have a normal endocrine, endocrine profile. And on physical examination, they typically have normal sized testes. Um, the one patient that can fool you, um, which happens to me about once a year, is somebody with a specific problem called maturation arrest. Maturation arrest is a variant of non-obstructive azospermia where uh, patients have a problem with meiosis and there is a halt in germ cell development, usually after the primary spermatocyte stage of spermatogenesis. Uh, but because the majority of testicular volume is reflective of germ cell number, um, those patients have a normal number of germ cells, they just don't develop fully. And they usually have normal testicular volumes and they often have hormone profiles that are normal or very, very close to normal. Um, so this is uh, this patient's hormonal results. Um, 
his FSH was 0 0.1, his LH was 0 0.2, and his total testosterone was 1,900 nanograms per deciliter. So um, if you just take a minute to think about why that would be, um, uh, it's probably because he's taking anabolic steroids, which in which case, in this particular case, uh, was what was happening. Uh, the other possibility um, is uh, testosterone producing adrenal or testicular tumor. Uh, so he kind of sheepishly admits to uh, taking off the street testosterone cypionate. He's been using 200 milligrams a week by intramuscular injection, which is a relatively high dose. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not aware of it, testosterone is a contraceptive. It has been um, studied extensively as a contraceptive. Uh, there have been uh, many large scale NIH funded trials uh, and World Health Organization trials looking at testosterone as a contraceptive. Um, and the efficacy um, is about 70% uh, to up to 90% in most of those studies. So why is it a contraceptive? Uh, testosterone, uh, exogenous testosterone suppresses anterior pituitary function. Uh, the anterior pituitary senses testosterone and estradiol, which is uh, made from testosterone through aromatization. Uh, testosterone and estradiol feedback negatively on the anterior pituitary, FSH and LH become undetectable, and uh, the testicles uh, stop functioning because they're not getting any stimulation from the pituitary. Of course, 70 to 90% is not effective enough to be uh, relied upon as contraception. Uh, there's still a lot of ongoing work looking at testosterone-based male contraception. Um, but this data is also very helpful in helping patients uh, understand recovery from uh, testosterone replacement therapy in terms of spermatogenesis. Uh, so this is probably the best available study looking at um, how quickly men recover. This is a little bit different though, because this is a study intended to look at contraception. So they gave short-term high dose androgens to healthy young men and then tracked their sperm production recovery over time. And uh, the recovery to 90% of baseline spermatogenesis takes about 17 months. Um, and if you look, it takes uh, on average between uh, six and eight months to get to 50% of normal sperm production. The reassuring part of this analysis though is that uh, almost everybody eventually recovers, but it can take up to two years. So uh, this scenario also comes up relatively commonly in my practice. Um, there's two options. You can wait for recovery. You can try to expedite it using endocrine therapy. Um, so what drugs are in our armamentarium to uh, manipulate the male reproductive hormonal axis? Well, we have Clomid, which is clomiphene citrate. It's uh, an FDA approved drug for ovulation induction. It is a female fertility drug used off label. It is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It has partial agonist, but mostly antagonist activity of estrogen receptors. Um, that antagonist activity uh, in, uh, prevents uh, estrogen from negatively feeding back on the anterior pituitary, resulting in increased production of gonadotropins, FSH, and LH. Uh, Clomid is also used uh, in the treatment of testosterone deficiency outside of fertility for either men who um, are actively trying to conceive uh, or who want to maintain the potential to conceive. Uh, the one caveat with Clomid, however, is that because of its partial estrogen agonist activity, um, it really has unpredictable effects on men. Uh, we've written a little bit about and published a little bit about estrogen signaling as it relates to sexual function in men, and it's really poorly understood, and I would say very unpredictable. I have men in my practice who uh, I treat with Clomid for low testosterone, who have a great biochemical response, meaning their blood work looks fantastic, their testosterone goes up, and they feel worse. And then you switch them to testosterone replacement therapy. They get the exact same testosterone level, and they feel much, much, much better. So you just have to keep that in mind when you're treating people with Clomid. Anastrozole is another commonly used medication in the management of male infertility. It prevents the aromatization of testosterone to estradiol. That results in buildup of systemic testosterone and also um, decreased negative feedback at the pituitary driving FSH and LH production. Uh, there's very good data about the use of anastrozole in azospermic mental Klinefelter syndrome. Um, 
there is also fairly good data uh, suggesting that if the ratio of testosterone to estradiol is uh, too low, that anastrozole may be a good drug for male fertility. Um, but in general, the use of these drugs is off-label um, and really for use in fairly specific scenarios like this, where you're trying to expedite recovery of spermatogenesis after suppression. Um, if you look at guideline statements about the management of male infertility, um, the, um, there is no hormonal therapy that is proven to be effective for most variants of male infertility outside of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, Kalman syndrome, and things like that. So on, a, on an exam, uh, these drugs are almost never the answer unless there um, is a very specific scenario. HCG is used a lot. Um, HCG is basically gonadotropin replacement therapy. It is biologically equivalent to luteinizing hormone and also has some avidity for FSH receptors and some FSH activity. So um, my preferred uh, treatment algorithm in cases like this is actually to use HCG. Um, I put him on a uh, cross taper to reduce his testosterone. Uh, started him on 2,500 international units of HCG three times a week. Um, gradually reduced his testosterone dose over time and eventually stopped it. Uh, three months after initial presentation, his testosterone was 400. Still didn't feel great. He was used to having testosterone levels of you know, 1,900. Uh, but his uh, gonadotropins started recovering. He, uh, at that point, was severely oligozoospermic. Uh, nine months later, his testosterone was 680. He felt better. His gonadotropins were normal. He had a normal semen analysis, and his wife got pregnant uh, uneventfully and fairly quickly once he recovered. Um, okay. Going to move on to a third case. Um, this is a 22-year-old. Uh, with a 21-year-old wife. They've been trying to conceive for two years. She also had a reassuring evaluation, and uh, he was also azospermic. Uh, his focused history is unremarkable. His exam um, was unremarkable, aside from, again, um, the finding of uh, his epididymis on both sides was flat, and his testicles were 10 cc's and soft. Um, so his laboratory evaluation was different. Uh, his serum testosterone was 305 nanograms per deciliter, and his FSH was 17.8 international units per liter. Uh, repeat semen analysis confirmed uh, persistence of azospermia. Uh, so this is non-obstructive azospermia. Uh, this is the most severe variant of male infertility, um, and it's a difficult diagnosis because um, success is certainly not guaranteed. Um, it is uh, very important in men with azospermia, or really any man with a sperm concentration, as we discussed previously, less than 5 million per milliliter, to get some genetic testing, and that's to look for Y chromosome microdeletions uh, and to look for uh, macro chromosomal abnormalities that are visible on a karyotype. So he, uh, this patient actually had uh, an EZFC deletion on his why microdeletion assay? So let's just talk a little bit about that because I think it's a sense of confusion for a lot of trainees. Um, uh, this was a, a graph that I showed earlier, but just to go over it in detail, in uh, azospermic men, 10% uh, of them um, have Y chromosome microdeletions. Another 14% have sex chromosome numerical or structural abnormalities, the most common of which is Klinefelter syndrome. And sometimes you see autosomal structural abnormalities, um, like translocations. Um, why microdeletion testing is done? Because these deletions result in spermatogenic failure, because there is a vertical transmission to offspring. So if a man who has a Y chromosome microdeletion has sperm that can be identified either in their ejaculate or in their testicles, and those sperm are used for assisted reproduction. Any sons they conceive are going to get the bad Y chromosome and have a similar problem with fertility. Uh, the response that couples have to that information is highly variable. Some couples really don't care and it doesn't alter their management. Other couples decide to adopt or to do IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to identify female embryos and to make sure that they don't have uh, an infertile boy. 
So it, 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 this testing empowers couples to make decisions. Um, there are also um, Y chromosome microdeletions that um, are incompatible with sperm production. And you wanna know about those before you put somebody through uh, something like a sperm retrieval procedure. An AZFC deletion actually has a, a better prognosis than almost all other variants of non-obstructive azospermia, um, with about a 70% likelihood of being able to identify sperm surgically. Um, but if you have an AZF-A or AZF-B deletion, uh, there's basically no hope. Um, what I tell our residents is A is awful, B is bad, C is chance, right? So that's a pretty easy way to remember this. Um, let me just uh, talk about what these regions refer to just very briefly. So they are not genes. There is no AZF gene. There's no AZF B gene. There's no AZF C gene. These are um, regions. The nomenclature is actually quite old. Um, and uh, there are, uh, there's much more contemporary, more accurate, more descriptive terminology to describe these mutations based on the specific palindromes of the Y chromosome that are involved in recombination events. Um, why microdeletions happen because the Y chromosome has a very palindromic structure. That's good for our species. Remember the Y chromosome is the only chromosome other than the X chromosome, it doesn't have a partner to pair with. So um, you know, the uh, exchange of genetic information that occurs during synapsis is important for development of species diversity. So the way the Y chromosome does that is by intrachromosomal recombination events. It recombines with itself. Um, that results in uh, genetic diversity, but it also results in predictable mistakes where uh, you get predictable patterns of DNA loss. So an AZF-A deletion is really a predictable loss of two specific genes that are critical for making sperm. An AZF-B deletion is specific loss of about six to eight genes that are critically important for making sperm. And uh, there are a couple of different variants of AZF-C deletions, um, but they all refer to loss of uh, genes within a region that encompasses about 15 to 20 genes that are important for making sperm. But people with AZFC deletions can make sperm and they often actually have uh, low levels of sperm in their ejaculate. Um, when I was at Cornell as a fellow, uh, we published a study um, that I think underlies the importance of Y chromosome microdeletion testing in that 6% of men with non-obstructive azospermia will have a Y chromosome microdeletion that is incompatible with spermatogenesis. So you, you're gonna to wanna to avoid doing unnecessary procedures in these patients because there's no, no chance of success. Um, the other karyotypic abnormalities that come up are Klinefelter syndrome and uh, occasionally uh, other translocations. The other translocations are important because they can affect uh, chromosome distribution during meiosis and result in genetic abnormalities like Down syndrome or uh, trisomy 18. And uh, if you have one of those, you're gonna to wanna to do IVF with pre-implantation genetic screening or at least uh, really aggressive genetic counseling with uh, either uh, amniocentesis or CVS uh, early in pregnancy to make sure that there's not a genetic lesion in the, conception, in the uh, embryo. Um, so you get a routine karyotype um, and a Y chromosome microdeletion assay in certainly any man with less than 5 million sperm per milliliter. Uh, some people think it, the threshold should be 10 million per ml. Um, so what do you do in non-obstructive azospermia to find sperm? Well, there are various things that you can do. Um, the physiology that is uh, very important to know is that for men that are making sperm, and it's about half of them probably, um, Sperm production is occurring in randomly distributed, rare seminiferous tubules throughout one or both testicles. So you can do a diagnostic biopsy in somebody with non-obstructive azospermia, get a result that says Sertoli cell only syndrome, which is the histological pattern that indicates zero germ cells are present. That person still has a 30% chance of success at finding sperm with an extensive sperm retrieval surgery. And that's because your biopsy just simply randomly missed one of the rare areas where sperm were being produced. So for that reason, diagnostic biopsies are not that useful anymore uh, and almost never done in clinical infertility management, at least here in the United States. Um, 
But this idea that you want to be able to find the random rare areas within one or both testicles where sperm are being produced is the guiding principle behind uh, all attempts at sperm retrieval. So uh, the gold standard procedure was developed at Cornell by Peter Schlegel. It's called a micro dissection testicular sperm extraction. Uh, each testicle, uh, you start with one testicle, you make a near equatorial incision to bivalve the testicle, and then using an operating microscope, you do a very sort of slow and meticulous search through each testicle, looking basically just for a fatter seminiferous tubule. Uh, the whole concept is that, you know, the seminiferous tubules that are active, if present, because they're active, they're going to contain stuff and they're going to be visually identifiable with high enough power optical magnification. Um, Dr. Schlegel's done a lot of work with that. And um, uh, indeed, uh, microdissection testicular sperm extraction has, I think, been pretty widely accepted as the gold standard procedure for sperm retrieval in non-obstructive azospermia. Um, if you're not going to use optical magnification to guide a sperm retrieval in non-obstructive azospermia, there are other approaches that you can use. Um, Testicular uh, large or fine needle aspiration can be used. Um, there are ways to map the testicle, but all of these procedures are best done by widely passing the needle through all areas of one or both testicles. Simply doing uh, you know, a needle biopsy with uh, a large needle in one area is inappropriate for men with non-obstructive azospermia. That approach is perfectly appropriate in somebody like post vasectomy who's got obstructive azospermia, but in someone with NOA, you're not going to want to do that. You're going to, at minimum, even if you're using a needle-based approach, widely sample both testicles. Sperm retrieval rates range from uh, about 15 to 17 percent using needle-based procedures up to, um, in some reports, of up to 70 or 75 percent. Uh, my own opinion is that the true sperm retrieval rate in men with non-obstructive azospermia who have never had a procedure before is probably around 50 or 55 percent using a testicular microdissection. Uh, so he had a bilateral microdissection. It failed. Um, his pathology was Sertoli cell only syndrome, and they adopted. Um, Alex, I've got two more cases, but I'm wondering if I should stop, do them for another lecture, and take questions now. What do you think? Or Mike, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, I, I, we have a lot of questions. So, um, you know, if we're at the conclusion of a case, I think it's probably reasonable to start on those. That's fine. I'm going to just go to the end of my talk because I, I don't know if you guys, did you guys see this picture? Um, did you guys see this rainbow in New York? Any, any of the residents that have been uh, on Monday night? I did, uh, not yeah, see I, I, I did not see this, but this is a pretty incredible picture. Um, I, you know, it's amazing in these times, which has been very obviously stressful for everybody in New York. Um, I think it's very hopeful to look at this. If you look at this picture closely, this is from Jersey City. And it's a rainbow connecting one World Trade Center to the Empire State Building. Pretty, pretty incredible photograph. Um, thank you. I just also want to personally thank either you guys. Uh, I know our residents, and I'm sure residents all across New York, have really put themselves in harm, harm's way um, and have been very, very proactive about taking care of the patients uh, in New York affected by COVID. So I just wanted to thank them personally.